All right, here we go. Overdrive off and running. TSN 1050 on the TSN app. Your home smart speaker up on TSN Plus all afternoon. Brian Hayes, and there he is, the main man himself, <laughs> Jason Strudwick. How are we doing, Strud? Any porta potties for you this afternoon? How are we feeling no. out there? No, I've avoided it, but I, I've taken a lot of abuse from, from uh, my friends about some of the comments that I made, but I think collectively we made about our good buddy's noodles. Right. So taking my lumps out here, buddy. A lot of friends of noodles are protecting him. Well, he's a good St. Albert boy, right? The pride of St. <laughs> Albert. Probably the most famous. Step aside, oh. Mark Messi. I think Mess is from St. Albert, right? He step yeah. aside, noodles, man. He owns I, that town. Again, Liz from there, Grand yeah. Fuhrer, and above them all, one – one person rises to the top. Yeah. Noodles. He, he sure does. Noodles <laughs> is the face of St. Albert. He's the king of St. Albert. Yeah, well, he's going to join us in an hour so he can defend himself and right. he, he can prove to the world that he actually drinks water, not flavored water, like legitimate <laughs> water. Uh, he can prove to the world that he's a pure athlete, right? And sure. it wasn't just a fluke. What else did we say about him yesterday? Uh, a that's a pretty good start. That's a pretty, pretty, pretty condemning <laughs> statement to start start his, his August off. <laughs> yeah. So he's coming out of the woodwork. You know it must have been bad when he's basically saying, "I got to get on here and answer right. for himself and and possibly defend himself." So Noodles will join us uh, in an hour, and I'm sure he's tracking the Olympic Games. I'm sure you are, Strutty. It's you know every day. It's, I, I find it. The beauty of the Olympics is that, and we were talking about this yesterday, you, you can just get lost in the schedule. Like, you, you can't plan anything. Like, if you, if you are a, a diehard fan of a specific event, of course, you're going to look at that and say, okay, when are they playing? You know, and I was tracking the men's basketball. I'm like, I know when they're tipping off. I know when they're playing. I know when the 100 meters going. I know when the 200 meters going. But weightlifting, you know, Taekwondo, I don't really know when that's going. I'm not, you know, circling that before the games. So you just kind of get lost in the wave and you, you flip it on 2.30 in the afternoon. You're like, hey, there we go. There's a bronze in an event I wasn't even thinking about, but this is amazing. Speed and that's kind climbing. of the beauty of the Olympic Games. Have you seen the speed climbing? Yes. Amazing. They look like horses galloping up a wall. Their athleticism is off the charts. I saw both the men's and women's, and they're getting up. I, I'm, I don't know. I'm guessing it's 30, 40 feet. Like, I didn't get the mm -hmm. exact height. They're going up that in seven seconds. It is crazy. It is ridiculous. It looks like they're horses running up a hill. It's, it's they're incredible, the athleticism. Their bodies, it's, they're so, it's so impressive. And I think more than ever, I'm really impressed by athleticism these people are showing. That's the beauty of it as well, right? It really puts it into perspective, the, the effort, the time, the dedication, the craft, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and also it speaks to like the party afterwards that we always hear about. And that's something you and I could keep up with, right? Like yeah. we could do the partying part. 100%. We couldn't do the wall climbing. We couldn't do the speed walking. We really couldn't do anything. But we could do the party afterwards because the buildup is so intense and, you know, it's like you, it's like building up for a heavyweight fight. Like you're waiting yeah. to get to the Olympic Games. You're not going to throw it away by doing something stupid two weeks before, a month before. You're on a strict sleeping regimen. You're on a very strict eating regimen. You're, you're dialed in. And once the event is over, whether you win, you lose, whatever it happens to be, I get the impression you get back to that village and you are flooring it unlike anyone possibly we've ever seen in <laughs> humankind. <laughs> like it's just – it's a relief and it is time to party for like 48 hours before you go back to wherever you're from. Well, because everyone's in the same boat, yeah. right? Every, everyone, everyone has been through the same as you. Trying, whether you're a favorite or someone who just making Olympics was a, a, an amazing accomplishment. But I wonder, what's the protocol in there? So let's say you and I are, are, are neighbors. Like you're in one room, I'm in the next room. And your, your event is day four. My, my event's not till day eight or nine. Mm -hmm. Like, is there a tap on the wall? Like, hey, keep it down over there. Like, what is the rule? Or is it on the outside? Like, do you put all the same people that are competing early in the Olympics in the same area? And then in the other wing, you put the later? Because I'm guessing, like you said, I mean, you're, you're just going to go and have a great time. I mean, all these similar people like they're great athletes yep. from different parts of the world you're ready to have a good time i mean paris is a pretty fun place oh, you know it's yeah. a pretty fun place for having to go oh, out yeah. and shake it up a little bit um you know i i think it would be i, I just wondered there's got to be some kind of a plan because you can't just have we're not you and i are sharing the room and we're competing at different times here yeah it there has it has to be figured out i'm sure that it is because you're right it's unfair to the athletes who are still in you know 
go zone, right? Like they're still sure. locked in and they're right. still training and they're still stretching and they're working out and they're eating properly and sleeping properly. It's it's kind of like exams. I've said that before. I know like you guys were playing in the NHL and I was at school, but you get your exam <laughs> schedule, yeah. you know, and it would be a two week window and half your friends would be done day four and you got two more left at the end and you're like, man, they are done and they are going <laughs> hard for like a week and I'm dying yeah. to go out. But I, I got another exam in two days. What am I supposed to I ended up going out anyway. Who am I kidding? But that was that was always the worst. You look at the sked, you're like, no, I got last day, which means everyone else has been off for weeks, if not certainly days, and they're having a great time, and you want to kind of ride that wave with them. So I'm sure the same thing applies when it comes to the Olympic Village, but we're tracking a lot today, including the U.S. is down 10 in the third quarter versus Serbia. They are down wow. 10, men's basketball. It's kind of wild, too. I'm on ESPN.com here. And th this was always going to be a part of this buildup is that it's Jokic versus MB. They always dodge each other during the regular season. It seems like one guy pulls the shoot. Generally, it's Embiid whenever he gets a chance to play Jokic. They only play twice a year. But it's Embiid versus Jokic as kind of the poster boys of this game, which is kind of crazy when LeBron's on USA, Steph Curry, Kevin Durant. Like, by no means is Embiid the face of this team. But that matchup is so significant because of how great these two players are, both you know, recent MVPs in the league. But France upset Germany earlier today. So Wemby and the French are off to the gold medal game, which is incredible. And now with the Americans, because I'm sure you saw it and you heard it too, Struddy, like leading up to this, there were a lot of pundits in the States trying to claim that this team's better than the dream team, that it's the greatest talent ever compiled in basketball history. And here they are in the semis and there's Jokic putting on an absolute clinic and Serbia's got them by 10 in the third quarter yeah pretty amazing and you know it's incredible I've been to a lot of people talk about how the the international basketball is different than the nba mm -hmm. and it's a lot more physical and um you know it that it, it in a lot of ways takes away some of the athleticism that nba players have they want to run the court they want to do all this stuff whereas with the international games a little more physical and especially the guards kind of get beat up right they kind of get roughed up as you're coming around the guys are able to kind of let, let you play a little bit more, a little bit more physical. Mm -hmm. So these players know it. You know, the Serbians, they know this game. And, you know, led by the Jokic's, who is incredible. And he just does – all he does is win. All he does is just perform. Like, I don't I don't think he really has a heartbeat. He just goes out there and he – every game, night after night, he performs at the biggest stages. And I do believe – and I, I don't know what the betting odds were, but I would believe this would be to be a big upset if Serbia is able to contain this. Oh, yeah. And it would be not unlike – if hockey for Canada, we did not make it to the gold medal in, in, and that's no disrespect to the Serbian players, but mm -hmm. it would be a significant outcome for that to happen. Uh, especially when you got a guy like, like Steph Curry and all these guys that maybe haven't been there before. So this is a big moment, I think, for basketball in the States. Doesn't mean that they can't play anymore, but it would be a huge win and a huge kind of, I think, kick in the junk for the old uh, Americans. Absolutely, it would be. And, and Germany's waiting for them in the bronze medal game if it gets to that point. Again, it's still tight. It's in the third quarter. I wouldn't put it past the Americans battling back and possibly winning this game. Um, I wonder what the live odds would be on FanDuel, actually. We should look at that because the States were obviously a big favor coming in. But you're right. It's like a continuation of what we were talking about earlier in the week where the international game – is just kind of taken over. And the best players in the NBA are international players like Jokic, um, like Shea Gilgis Alexander, like Luka Doncic, like Wemby. Wemby's coming. Like Wemby had a pretty good game today. Kid's 19. He might win a gold medal. Guy's going to likely be the best player in basketball in three or four years, if not sooner than that. And LeBron's getting old. Steph's getting old. Kevin Durant's getting old. Like if Jokic finds a way, and the Serbians as a team, because it is a team sport, to, to knock out the Americans in the semifinal, that would be that would be incredible. And you're right about Jokic and his his general approach. Like he never changes his disposition at all. Like he just he always looks like he's at the Y, just out playing. Like, did you even stretch? <laughs> you know what I mean? He just looks like yeah. he's out there and he's just a pure baller. He's smarter than everyone else. He can hit any shot. Uh, he pick and rolls, he rebounds, he's a triple-double machine, and the guy just wins all the time. And he just yeah, always looks like he just wants to go home and watch, like, horse racing. He's <laughs> like a diehard horse racing guy. That's all he wants to do.
Well, do you remember after they won their championship in Denver? They yeah. said, you know, how are you feeling? He's like, I'm feeling good. Now we can go home. That's <laughs> yeah. what he said. Yeah, like, exactly. Like anybody else is like, I can't wait to go out. I can't wait to celebrate with my family. I can't right. do this. He's like, I just, now we can go home. I thought that was the funniest line. And, you know, it's him. It just, to, to me, it just is like, that is who he is. If you don't know him, if you've never seen him, that is what he's like. He's just like, I'm here to do my job. I'll, I'll, I'll help everyone win. And then I'm just going to leave and go over and do whatever I want. And I'm sure he feels the same way about this. Um, now, you know, let's assume they don't, they, they are able to win Serbia. I, you know, seeing Victor and, and, uh, Jokic go at it in the, in the gold medal final, I think that'd be pretty good for basketball. That would but be it, pretty incredible. It'd it'd be incredible. And I think that having international stars has been so valuable for the NBA. It is, it is humongous because it grows the, the reach of the game and becomes so much uh, more international. Maybe what we have in some other sports, like specifically Canada or uh, Mm. hockey, that is not, doesn't have that same kind of reach. So this is, it's, it'd be a tough thing for the NBA players, but a great thing for basketball because it just expands the reach, more people interested and stars in every country. Uh, yeah, or, or many countries, I should say. It really is huge. Like there, I think what what the sport of basketball. Like I know there's a commissioner in the NBA, but if there were a commissioner of the sport of basketball, I think you'd you'd realize your goal would be to ch- to chase second place domestically in the U.S. and internationally around the world. Because in the states, you're not passing football. Like it's just not ever going to happen. I don't think in our lifetime. I, I just football in the NFL and college football is such a juggernaut. It's so popular. It's worth so much. The ratings are insane. I, I think the NBA and basketball purists, they understand that too. You're chasing two, and they probably are there right now on a professional level. And the same thing internationally. You're not, you're not passing soccer around the sure. world. Like it's not going to happen. But if you can have a sport that's number two in the States in terms of popularity and in terms of, I, I guess, making money and generating revenue and number two internationally around the world – that's huge, man. Like that's that's like all boats are gonna rise. Like everyone's gonna make a lot of money. It's gonna be an incredibly popular sport. You're gonna you're gonna inspire a lot of kids around the world that want to play. Um, and it's just, yeah, it would be pretty incredible. Like the Americans have dominated this for a long time. Obviously, the Dream Team in '92, and they've had they've had some some tough outs. Like they've 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 embarrassed themselves internationally a few times in the early 2000s, mid 2000s. But if they were to lose this with LeBron, with Steph, with KD, uh, with all the depth that they have, and it's Serbia, France in the final, that, that will be that will be shocking. Like that will really be shocking. The Canada's out, the US is out, Germany was a heavy favorite against France, they're out, or I guess playing for bronze. Uh, it'd be be pretty incredible. So we're tracking that. Uh, again, Serbia's up nine in the third quarter. We'll see uh, what ends up going on there. And not, I wouldn't say it was necessarily an upset, especially with the news that came out. Uh, Noah Lyles, the 200 men's 200 meter was being run today and Lyles won the 100 meter and he was trying to pull off what Usain Bolt pulled off multiple times. You know, Bolt did it three Olympics in a row, which is just incredible. Win gold, the 100, win gold, the 200. And my understanding was Lyles was more of a 200 meter specialist than a 100 meter specialist. He ended up winning bronze today, which is still an accomplishment, but it came out shortly after the event, which I found convenient that it came out afterwards as opposed to beforehand, right? Like, of course, yeah. it comes out afterwards. Someone leaks it from the American camp that he tested positive for COVID before the race. And it's uh, listen, obviously, that's tough. He's probably not feeling great. He's still finished with a bronze. But really, what sticks out more than anything to me, Strud, is if that were the case three years ago, the guy would have been escorted out of Japan. <laughs> you know, they would have shut the Olympic Games down. Yeah, now this right. guy's got COVID. Like, yeah, who cares? Yeah. Go run the race. Doesn't even Let matter. Him run. Anymore. Good luck. Yeah. No, you know, he, he's a great story, and I actually I don't know if you're familiar. There's a there's a show on Netflix called Sprint. Yeah. They kind of they did a lot of it was kind of like the the male and female. They tracked them both for the hundred and two hundred, and kind of their 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 lead up to what be, I guess, the world championship. I think there's going to be another one coming out in the fall just about the Olympics. Um, but it was really neat to see the way these guys prepare and these girls prepare and, and, and the rivalries, the training facilities, all that kind of stuff. And Noah is a very confident guy. He, he comes across as an ultra confident guy. So I was, I was kind of like, I wanted him to win, but I also want to see if he didn't win. Yeah. So I think he got he got the 100, which you know I, I think people all, most people agree that's the, the feature race. And to get third when you're sick, that's, that's still pretty good for the 200. Um, um, but he made those comments about the NBA, how they're not world champions and, mm-hmm. you know, becoming that. And I, I agree with him. I do agree. I never really understood that, that they said that. But he gets a bronze. He gets the gold. Um, you know, I don't know. I didn't see what it said about him maybe racing other events because he was 
trying to get four golds. Mm-hmm. Um, so now he's on a track for that. But he, you know, he did show up and he did compete, and he is a fast, very fast guy. But it, that that hundred meter we talked about with Donovan Bailey yesterday, that race to me was one of the greatest races I, I've ever seen because it was so so tight and so much fun. So for him to come out of that with a gold medal, I still think he's. His, his reputation's in, intact here. Absolutely. Right? You got you got the big one for sure. Yeah. And, you know, you still meddled here in the 200 meter, but you're right. Like, he shows a lot of confidence, and there's a thin line between confidence, oh. arrogance, yeah. and generally it comes down to how you actually end up finishing, right? Like, if you win gold, it's confidence. If you lose, it's arrogance that clipped you, you know? And it's usually in <laughs> retrospect you look back and say, oh, that's arrogance. Oh, actually, it was confidence. And, you know, I, I appreciate it. We talked about it. You mentioned it with Donovan Bailey. What you loved about Donovan in 96 was he was puffing his chest out saying, I'm coming and I'm taking this and I'm the best. I'm the best. And I'm, I, that's an attitude that I have a great appreciation for when you prove that you are. And he and Bailey did 96. Noah Lyles did here in 2024 when it comes to the 100 meter. So you're right. He doesn't have to answer for anything. You, you can say, hey, you talked a big game. Guess what? Yeah, he talked the talk, but he also walked the walk. So good for him. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what, el- what else he ends up running in in terms of relays and, and what have you. But um, there's a lot going on, again, with, with Canada. Maude Chiron, who was uh, an opening ceremony uh, flag bearer, she won silver today in weightlifting. And awesome. the women, the, the beach volleyball has been electric. Oh. They're off to the finals. They ended up winning so earlier good. today. Incredible. And uh, Gord Miller was actually there. And Gord's going to join us from Paris at like 530, get his take live from the event. What was it like today? Pretty it's electric. Yeah. That, that is one I want to go and watch. Like, I want to see it live. And I've been following those ladies, uh, you know, their whole journey. And if, if you didn't see it, they were in a, they had a very difficult round robin. And then they had to get into the lucky losers. They called it the lucky losers match to get into the kind of the play down. And they made it. Then since then, they've been playing really well. And I think they actually lost their first set today. It was the first time they've met lost since kind yes. of this playoff spot. Um, but what a story. And the announcer, I forget his name, but he kept saying, no, there's always a moment where you have to overcome something major. He kept saying that in that lucky losers victory they had. And they did. And now they're rolling. And now, you know, I don't think many people expected to beat the Americans. And then the Swiss team was big. They're really athletic and defensive. Incredible. And they beat them, came back, and now the final. So that's must watch. For me, that is much yes. watch TV to see these ladies uh, and the, the the action at that like people are singing they're dancing like I love it the beach volleyball we gotta, gotta get in there oh, and it's the best great. venue too you got the Eiffel Tower oh, right behind it it's beautiful. like basically under the Eiffel Tower yeah beautiful. like what a setup that is man that 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 yeah. was smart city planning and Olympic planning you got to get the Eiffel Tower in the background and Paris yeah. like just the scene of Paris is it's the incredible like cinema i guess you could say right or or you know just the way that they're the ins and outs everything yeah. cbc tsn sportsnet like where whatever they're showing it's always like in and out paris in and out the eiffel tower all these yeah. just incredible <laughs> landmarks it's just an amazing back backdrop i guess for an olympic games so well, and if you imagine like riding your bike, there's a bike races through yep. Paris, the streets of Paris. Like I ride my bike, but let's, let's be honest here. I'm not that fast. And I, you know, I've got a basket on the front and the back. <laughs> right, and so I'm not, but I would love to ride my bike like that, with just no worried about lights or cars. And like, yeah. what a great memory. And the, the American, um, Kristen uh, Stelter or something, I can't remember her last name. She won it, the, the road race. And it was so great to see, like to come across like that, like the energy, like I just, to went there would be so, Winning Olympic anywhere would be special, but winning, I think, ra- racing through those streets the best. would be so special. So special. Well, it's, that's the Tour de France, right? Like, the, they finish right. your biking yeah. through Paris, and, like, it's just an incredible race and a, an incredible finale, and they're doing the same thing. And that's kind of the cool thing, too, is that there's an awareness there. Like, you know, the tennis is at Roland Garros. So you're like, all right, I, <laughs> I know what this looks like. I know what yeah. this is all about. And uh, it's just been an incredible backdrop and scenery really throughout the games. So Gord is coming up. Gord Miller will join us later this afternoon. The Jays back in action tonight. They lost last night, but Vladdy got a hit. Vladdy's got 19 straight games now with a hit. And uh, you look at his stats over that 19-game hitting streak, 34 for 69. So he's hitting 493, 10 doubles, 9 home runs, 18 RBI. Uh, the guy's hitting well over 300, OPS well over 900. He just He's so... He's so dialed in. It's so disappointing that it's happening, you know, with losing hanging over the organization. Uh, And this is the nature of baseball is that I, 
you know, I got into it a little bit with some people I was talking to the last couple of days about whether or not, you know, can Vladdy show up in the clutch? Can Vladdy be there when you need him during the playoffs? And, you know, baseball, I, I, I don't know if there's enough data there to know exactly what he's going to look like in an ALDS, CS World Series. He hasn't been there yet, but it's an individual sport regardless of the scoreboard all the time. Like who, whenever you step in the box, the pitcher and that defense and the pitching coach and the opposing manager, they are game planning to stop you, whether they're the best team in the league, worst team in the league, two outs, ninth inning, game seven of the World Series, or game one of the regular season. It's generally a very similar you know, mentality and approach. And I, I, just, I guess what I'm saying is I don't want to pour any water – uh, or douse anything on this this Vladdy streak because he looks so good. He's performing every single night. You can feel it. Uh, he's hitting for power. You know, the exit velocity is there. Um, it always leads to the question, you know, what are they going to pay him? What's the contract going to look like? He played third base last night. I don't think that's – listen, he didn't look good. He had two errors last night at third. He's played a little bit. I don't think he's a third baseman. I think they know he's a first baseman and a DH, and that's the issue with paying him huge money, Strud, is you want him playing a more prominent defensive position if you're going to give this guy $300 million plus. You know, if he's just sitting there at first base, they're, they're dying for him to play third. I just think they know he can't. So they're – it's, it's – making it more difficult to figure out whatever that dollar amount's going to look like. But um, full credit to Vladdy because it's ugly. A lot of guys being traded. You know, Bo's not around. Who knows what's going to happen with Schneider, the staff. It's it's a really kind of dark energy around that team. But the one shining light is Vladdy Guerrero, and it's every single night he's dialed in. Yeah, it's it's fun to watch. He's very talented. You know, and you kind of made the, the point about um... – you know what? What we look like as he goes deeper in the playoffs, and I, I always believe that I, I want to give talent a chance. At least I want to find out. Yes. You know, like he's a very, very talented guy. So you're willing to, you know, well, let's just see what happens. You know, he's, he obviously everyone has their ups and downs, but I, it was funny because I watched the of that game and I was thinking about what Steve Phillips talked about about the. Who, who, let's assume it's the same people in charge, yeah. and now how they have to be creative. You know, and, and, and watching uh, Varshawn, how he's such a good defensive player but maybe not the offensive player in need and do you, is it worth that trade off the offense for the defense or the defense for the offense and it, it is a really interesting thing to, to, to look at and I wonder these two guys built it this way you know, chose to go this way. Are they the guys to unravel it and now to make the right joint changes to find the right balance? Because maybe they've, they've gone too far mm-hmm. the one way. But it's definitely Vladdy's part of the answer offensively. Yep. But at third does it? How much does it take off of that offense if he's playing third? Because you want to put him at third so you can get a first baseman, which is maybe easier to find a good hitting first baseman yep. than a good hitting third baseman. So, like that's just that complexity that Steve was kind of referring to yesterday when we spoke to him. Well, and and the last twenty four hours have gone down in in the city the exact way I thought it would. Like no one's supporting Shapiro's messaging. Like <laughs> it's very difficult to find anyone that's a believer that Shapiro and Atkins will be able to make this a championship contending team next year. Right. Can they be better? Sure. And that's another thing about what Vladdy's doing here is they spent all of last season, effectively all of it, once Otani didn't sign here, saying internal improvement, internal improvement, internal improvement. Well, Vladdy supplied them with internal improvement. Like last year, he didn't have a very good statistical year. In fact, he had a, a porous one based on expectations. This year, he's blown through the expectations going the other way. They, but they can't say there's our internal you know, improvement because everyone else has fallen off and they're 10 games under 500. Uh, so, you know, they want to bump the tires of Vladdy. They want to say, well, see, this is what Don Mattingly is bringing to the table. And this is what Guillermo Martinez is still bringing to the table or whoever it's going to be that might be helping Vladdy unlock what he's been unlocking. But you're right. I mean, Vladdy's just one piece of the puzzle. Vladdy's going to get like five at-bats a game. You got to find what else. What else is out there? Who's playing left field? If Vladdy's playing first, who's going to play third? Who's going to play second? Who's going to be behind home plate if Kirk's not playing all the time? Who DHs? There, there's just there's so many question marks, um, and you know social media again is not an exact science, but y- you can get a decent read on how people are feeling. And I just I couldn't find anyone that was writing. <laughs> Talking, yeah. TikToking, tweeting, Instagramming, Facebooking, anything positive about Shapiro's messaging yesterday. So it's a real uphill battle for this front office. You know, if they're all going to be back, and it sounds like that'll be the case, and they have intentions of competing and chasing a championship in a World Series, they, they are going to have to pull off some magic. And it's to the point, Strud, where I'm not sure they can even do enough in terms of, like, movement – to make people really be a believer. The only way they're going to believe, and I think Shapiro knows this. He kind of said it yesterday. 
they they got to work hard. They got to plug in a lot of pieces, and then they got to win ball games, and a lot of them early in the season next year, because you know even if you make a couple of shrewd signings, a nice trade or two, it's still going to be what have you done for me lately? And people are so bitter with things that I just don't think they're going to get some parade because they won the off season. I'm not sure it's possible for them to win the off season in the eyes of the majority of Blue Jay fans right now. No, so. and that's it. You got to get it done, right? You yep. got to get it done, and, and the working hard. I. I, that one, I, I just, I don't really like that comment. Everyone's, everyone's working right, hard. Right, exactly. Like, Only I, I just, we're going to work hard. Yeah, that we'll should be hard. understood. Like, it's when people say, we're going to work so hard as a team, or we're going to grind. Like, I think everyone is. Yes. Right? So what, what, what do you do outside of that to find solutions to, to what's happened? Exactly. Uh, week 10 in the CFL, kicking off tonight. Red Blacks, a favorite at home against the Rough Riders. Dave Naylor will join us to tee up week 10. Quarterback shuffle with the Argos. We'll tell you about that. And Dave's down at Buffalo Bills camp. We'll get an update on the Bills. How does that offense look? How's Josh Allen feeling right now? What do we make of Sean McDermott coming back? There's another guy down in Buffalo. Some people, not the biggest fan of McDermott, yet he gets to the playoffs pretty much every year. They've been in the playoffs for four straight. So we'll catch up with Dave and get his take on what he's seeing out of the uh, Buffalo Bills and other storylines throughout the NFL. We've got Noodles coming up. Noodles will be on the show at 5. So he wants to answer for <laughs> a few things that were thrown out yesterday on this show. And we're going to give him the full, the floor, right, Strad? We'll say, go ahead. It's your floor, man. Yeah. You do what you got to do. Tell uh, us we're wrong. Yeah, tell us, tell us we're wrong. Exactly. You proved to us that we're wrong. So Noodle's coming up as well. Jason Strudwick in here. I'm Brian Hayes. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on the TSN app. Overdrive continues. Brought to you by FanDuel. Bringing you everything from the opening line to the final score. Brian Hayes, Jason Strudwick, Dave Naylor coming up here in a moment. Struddy, I guess I'll ask you this. Um, I know you're aware of the White Sox and how awful <laughs> they've been for two years. They oh, fired geez. their manager today. Uh, Worst franchise the last two years, the Chicago White Sox or your Edmonton Elks? Oh, geez. Um, man, I guess I got to go local here with the, the Elks. Have just, <laughs> it's been tough. What do they have? Nine wins in our last 40 some games. Like, it's yeah. been really one and seven not, this year. It's awful. Yeah, not winning at home. Um, really, really. There's a, there is a lot of angry people here in Edmonton about how that's going. Yeah, that was uh, – I think they broke some history, didn't they, with the amount of home losses in their own four this year to start the season. Um, yeah, it's tough, man. It's really tough. Like, the White Sox are bro- – I think they've had, like, a 316 winning percentage in the last two years. But I'm not sure the Elks are much better than that. Um, here's our TSN football insider. Uh, now, again, I know there was a time in your life where you were a diehard baseball fan. I'm sure you're aware of how bad the White Sox are. Oh. How would you answer that? White Sox or Elks? Well, I got, I, got an, I, I got to say, I was looking at the White Sox about a month ago, and I saw their team batting average was 221. And, like, I don't, I don't follow baseball like I used to when I was younger, and I was, like, like, addicted to it. And I was like, hold on a second, 221 is the team batting average? Like, what used to get, you know, released if you were batting 221. Now that's the team <laughs> average? Holy smoke. It's awful. Um, oh, my goodness. Yeah, and I, yeah, the... I mean, I got to go Elks, and here's why: football losses sting more than baseball losses. You know, so when you're stringing, you know, 22 consecutive home losses in football, that's like that's over a much, much longer period of time as opposed to you know 22 straight baseball losses. So I'm going Elks on the futility scale. But Strutty, good news: my sources tell me in about eh, 10 days or so, maybe, maybe you wrote that. The Elks will introduce their new owner. Oh, so, yeah, yeah. People want so, that. People want yeah, that here so badly. It's, it's well, first time. Five years. Seventy-five yeah. years of community ownership. Yeah. End of an era. Yeah, and it's going to be a lot of good things, but they need to change. And I guess when you look at Nato, why did it take so long to get Trey Ford behind center? Like, what, what, what was going on? Like, is there something wrong with Trey Ford that we don't know about? Well, uh, look, there's always potential that you know the public doesn't see habits about a guy or the way he does things and coaches don't want to give them opportunities until they do it the right way. And I don't know if that's part of the trade for thing, but people have speculated about that because it's been so mystifying. But here's the thing. Trey Ford is a, is a total unicorn. All right. I mean, do me the list of guys who played Canadian university football and have started multiple games at quarterback in the CFL in the last 30 years. There's a couple 
but they, they're not like Trey Ford. Like this guy played at the University of Waterloo, and he played at Waterloo over COVID. So like he didn't play that much university football, even at the U sport level that has like an eight game regular season. So I think part of it was the coaches feeling like he did more seasoning, more time to kind of you know practice, do reps, all those kinds of things. And that may be part of why we saw him play so well is that they have kind of slow played it a little bit. But I think the other part of it, the biggest part was Trey Ford is a high ceiling and potentially high floor kind of player. I think at this stage of his career, McLeod Bethel Thompson is a lower ceiling but a higher floor kind of player, I think, in general. So with Chris Jones, you know, knowing that back-to-back four-win seasons, you want to roll it on the guy who might give you a great performance but might not? Or do you want to roll it with the guy that you think, you know, he's going to give us a minimum performance and we'll try and win with him? And, look, you know, they lost, what, four straight games by three points and three by walk-off field goals, so it's not like they were getting killed. But ultimately, that's Ray Ford's the right call now. I, I, I mean, it was a sp- spectacular performance. Uh, his game against you know, at Saskatchewan against a good defense on the road where they were behind early. I, I think ultimately it was just you know a bit of Jones stubbornness and a bit of like also when they bring McLeod Bethel Thompson essentially out of retirement and pay him a whack of money, that always matters too, right? You, you didn't bring him out of retirement and pay him a whack of dough. So you can bench him in three games. So I think I think it's multiple reasons. I, you know, people say, "Oh, Chris Jones doesn't like Canadian quarterbacks." Okay, I think Chris Jones has played more snaps with a Canadian quarterback than any coach in the CFL in the last, you know, pick your year, 30, 40 years, because he had Brandon Bridge in Saskatchewan and he played Trey Ford. So I mean, it's not like you know the Canadian coaches in the league are playing Canadian quarterbacks. They're not. So I, I don't buy the Canadian quarterback bias thing. I do think there's a bit of a U sport. You know, kind of hesitation because the level is such a big gap. But like I said, Trey Ford's a unicorn. Well, st- sticking with the quarterback theme in the CFL, the Argos uh, have Calgary in town this week, and we're into week ten. So uh-huh. you know, the, the, the Chad Kelly news is coming up, I suppose. Nick Arbuckle though is going to get the start. Ryan Dinwiddie announcing that today. Cameron Dukes is banged up. He didn't, you know, fully outright say that Dukes will not be available to play. But it sounds like Nick Arbuckle will get the the first you know, team snaps or first first team reps anyway in, in practice this week, and then he'll be playing against uh, Calgary this weekend. But where are we at with the quarterbacking position in general here in in Toronto, Dave, and, and where do the Argos see this going? Well, I'll tell you, the league and the Argos are so sick of my texts and my calls on this stuff. I mean, I lit- literally daily, you know, any yep. news, what uh, – you know, they're, they're keeping a the curtain pulled on this one. Um, look, I believe – that Chad Kelly has completed all of the courses that he was required to do. I believe he's had all the assessments he was supposed to do. I'm not sure whether all the reports that are, have to come back have come back. I would anticipate there's probably a meeting with the commissioner at some point before all of this. But we're getting pretty close here, right? Kelly, theoretically, should be eligible to play on August 22nd. And the article is on bye week next week, which means at most he's going to have one week of practice and let's, you know, let's not kid ourselves. Chad Kelly will walk in as the number one quarterback the moment this suspension ends. So I would not be surprised if we hear something, you know, as early as, as Friday, like before the Argos be, go on by. That, that's what I would expect. Uh, you know, again, if there's no hiccups here, right? Like I, I think behind the scenes, the reason no one wants to commit and say, oh, it's going to happen at this time is because he's got to clear every hurdle. And, you know, some of Chad's history is, he doesn't clear all the hurdles, so you know we'll see where where he's at. And but I, it's it's been shrouded in a lot of secrecy. And I, I don't. I mean, I've been kind of critical of the league on this one, to be honest. Like this is a, the MOP, the outstanding player in the league. He's the face of your franchise in Toronto, whether you like him or not. That's the reality. And he's due to come back on suspension on August the twenty second, and we still don't have any clarity on it. Like I, I, I think it behooves the league to give us some soon. Naylor, when you look at how this is handled right from the get-go, do you think that this situation will maybe make the CFL and, and teams themselves kind of update the way that they approach uh, these types of uh, scenarios in the future? I, I think this is a unique one. I really do. Okay. Like, and, and, it, and here's why, right? Chad Kelly arrived in this league not as an unknown quantity on or off the field, and it's the off-the-field part that I'm talking about, right? Uh, trouble in high school, trouble in college, Trouble in the NFL. And, you know, I always say 
if a guy has trouble sort of keeping it between the white lines when he's in the NFL with millions of dollars at stake, the odds of him keeping it between the white lines with hundreds of thousands of dollars at stake are not good. And look, you know, for two years, we didn't hear boo about Chad Kelly behind the scenes, but then all of a sudden we did. So I think the reason he got such a stiff suspension and the reason they had a, you know, an investigation and all that went into this is because of the history. And, you know, like, you know, he went on social media while his kind of future was hanging in the air with the commissioner having to make a decision on a suspension pending a report. And, um, you know, I'll just say he showed a very strong lack of self-awareness in some social media videos that were out, you know, February, March, that kind of time. So I think it, it all kind of compiles, right? And then they're looking at it and saying, okay, this guy's history is that he's given do-overs and nothing changes or things don't change. So we're going to go to extraordinary steps here to try to, you know, give him the ability to, to change and, and, and to, to do the things he needs to do to be in the league. So... I think it took some convincing on his uh, on their on the team and the and the Argos and the league's part. I don't know that he you know leaned into this willingly at least off the bat, but I think if he hadn't eventually leaned into it willingly, the Argos I'm not sure that I'm not sure what the outcome would have be would have been. Let me put it that way. So, you know, every case is different. Every guy is different, and, and I don't think that if Chad Kelly had you know not had the history that he had and and some of the things he did in the kind of interim while the decision was pending. You know, that it would have been half a season, but they, they, it, that, it was the whole kind of ball of wax, I think. With Dave Naylor, our TSN uh, football insider. So you've been down at Bill's camp the past couple of days, and, uh, yeah. you know, Josh Allen, right? Sandy, I don't know if he's going to miss Stephon Diggs. Um, you know, I saw your piece on Sports Center about they've been a team that was looking to attack the outside. Now it's coming in. They've got a couple of good tight ends. Hopefully they finally have a run game. Maybe they can have faith in. You know, Allen's still going to run the ball. Um, what's the general consensus in terms of optimism this season around the Bills camp these days? I think there's, you know, there's a different feel, right? Because when I've been there the last couple of years, the national media is rolling through. Josh Allen's getting all kinds of rose petals thrown at his feet. The Bills are Super Bowl favorites, you know, that kind of stuff. And it just kind of felt like a normal camp this year, you know? With And again, there, the last few years, there haven't been a lot of jobs up for grabs, at least, especially you know, starting jobs or number one roles, those just haven't been available. So there hasn't been that kind of drama. But this year, I mean, you know, the most kind of jump out at you stat is that the Bills have one receiver who's ever caught a pass from Josh Allen. You know, and, and Khalil, Shakir, Khalil Shakir is the only holdover receiver. You know, Gabe Davis and Stephon Diggs combined last year, they had 241 targets. 44% of all Josh Allen passes went to them. And look, maybe this is optimism, you know, from the media and fans in, in Buffalo, but there is this kind of sense that, you know, that Allen was maybe burdened by the idea that, you know, Stefan Diggs has got to get his targets, right? You, that you, well, no matter what the game plan is, you got to throw a certain number of passes his way because you're paying him this amount of money and you got to keep him happy. And they're kind of freed from all of that. Now, the question is, if you get rid of one of the best receivers in the NFL or a guy who has been over the last five years one of the best receivers in the NFL – I mean, I think Steph Diggs has more NFL touchdowns with the Bills than like their entire receiving core has kind of combined in their careers or thereabouts. So you're talking about Khalil Shakir is going to be you know a top target now. Now this is a guy whose catch percentage last year was 86.7 percent. That was number one in the NFL. So yeah, you want to get him more targets. You have Dalton Kincaid who had the 10th best receiving t- season for a, t- a rookie tight end in NFL history. So yeah, you're going to get him more targets. And you've got Curtis Samuel, who you can move all over the field and maybe even use in the backfield a little bit. You're going to play two tight end sets with Knox and Kincaid. Uh, you've got Mar- Marquez Valdez-Scantling hanging around. You've got a rookie in Keon Coleman that you drafted high who's looked great. And, you know, you've got Chase Claypool looking from the outside in because he hasn't practiced in about 10 days. But, you know, th- there's, lots of, there's lots of options around. And I think there's just a real curiosity about what, that's going to look like. And, you know, Joe Brady as the offensive coordinator, I think is seen as a guy who likes to mix and match and, and, you know, do bunch formations and different things maybe that they weren't doing under Ken Dorsey when they were far more of a wide receiver centric offense than they've been kind of the last little while. So, you know, I, I think that's far and away the number one story and getting all of the kind of speculation and anticipation in Bill's land. 
Well, uh, we get closer to the NFL season. As for the CFL season, week 10 tonight, Ottawa favored at home. They've been good, but the Riders have been really good. You got a cool feature on a Red Blacks defensive lineman tonight, Dave. What's going on there? Yeah, Lorenzo Malden, who was the defensive player of the year in 2022 with the Ottawa Red Blacks. Uh, he, was, uh, he was a 2015 third-round pick of the New York Jets, had a serious back injury and kind of fell out of the NFL that way. And look, we do lots of stories about guys from – you know, tough backgrounds. That's I think part of the part of the sport of football. There's lots of guys who use football to to raise their lives and, and get themselves to places they might not otherwise get. And I mean, Lorenzo Malden was one of those ones. I knew a little bit about his history. Uh, I knew he was basically raised without parents in a series of foster homes, like maybe a dozen and group homes, and like basically his whole life. You know, never had had his parents around him. His father went to jail for manslaughter. His mother went for selling cocaine, later went for manslaughter. I mean, it's a, it's a harsh story. And I met this guy at the CFL Awards in 2022, and I, I, I just was kind of blown away by his presence and the way he told his story. And I thought, man, there's a guy who's, whose story we got. To, he was a front-page story in the New York Times uh, when he was with the Jets. Uh, the story was called Everyone's Son. And it was about how the people around Maynard Jackson High School in Atlanta – had recognized this guy. He had a lot of anger uh, from his upbringing, and he used football to kind of exercise that anger. But he invited people into his life. He got his degree. He's got a young family. Just one of those man, uptick stories. Uh, and a guy that was just been tremendous to work with. And uh, we went down to Atlanta, uh, you know, to, to spend some time. His high, you know, I love this stuff in football, right? His high school coach was Brett Favre's tight end at Southern Miss. I love that stuff. You know, it's like, <laughs> so good. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, yeah, we're really proud of this one. And and the layer tonight on Sports Center, Lorenzo Malden, uh, defensive end with the, number ninety four for the Ottawa Red Blacks. Can't wait for that. That's going to be great up on TSN tonight. The CFL on TSN. All right, now got great stuff, buddy. We'll do it again soon. Thanks so much, guys. Have a good show. You got it. There's Dave Naylor. Yeah, Lorenzo Malden, man. And the Red Blacks, like, they, they've been – they haven't been great for a couple of years, but they're they're playing well today and or as of this season, and they're favored tonight against a good Riders team. But, uh, yeah, that's going to kick off tonight, CFL on TSN. All right, Noodles coming up in about uh, 15 minutes. Jamie McLennan. We'll get into the athletic piece from earlier in the week, Strutty. You and I haven't talked about it yet, where fans are ranking their teams based on confidence. And the Leafs and the Oilers were way down the list. We'll get your take on that. What's going on with the Edmonton <laughs> Oilers fans out there? What else do you want? I get you lost, but it was game set of a, of a cup final. I mean, come on. So more on that. And it looks like the U.S. is going to squeak one out here on Serbia. They've stormed back in the fourth quarter. They're dominating. And uh, they're up four late. Looks like it's it's going to be the U.S. into the uh, gold medal match against France. Serbia will play Germany for bronze. So more on that as well as we're tracking the Olympics over in Paris. Overdrive continues, TSN 1050 and on TSN+. Plus. All right, noodles coming up in about 10 minutes. The U.S. has beaten Serbia. So we were talking a big game an hour ago, me and you, Strud. Like it was over. Serbia, we should have known better. Of course, the Americans came back. But good for them. They're a great team. What are you it's great do? for the Olympics. Like, let's be honest. That's what if you are organizing, you want the home nation against yep. the star-studded team, right? Like, it. Not that they need more to sell more tickets, but mm-hmm. that is a dream door gate, I think. Right? The, the home teams will be fanned up, or the home team fans will be fired up. Mm-hmm. The Americans want to win. They probably think they're pretty strong uh, favorites in this game. So I, I think it's. I mean, it's good for the game. I, you know, if that's what we're. Creating. It is a dream final. Fair. You're right. I mean, if you're going to take Canada out of it from our perspective. For sure. It's a dream final. Yeah. France versus the U.S. And I'm sure, you know, if you're Adam Silver, you're loving this too. Because it's, you know, not that LeBron and those guys need more of a profile. But there's other younger players on the American team that have a chance here to do something big in the gold medal match. But it's it's Wembenyana. You've got Wemby playing against the Americans for gold in Paris. It really is a perfect script. It's great. You know, I'm, I'm guessing. I don't know if the Americans would be a ten point favorite. I wouldn't be shocked. It's got to be. Right. It's got to be six and a half, seven and a half point spread. I would think. But uh, Serbia was a big dog too, and they obviously yeah. not only covered the number, they almost won the game. So, so it's a beauty of France. Well, what's what do you got to lose, man? 
Like yep. it, I, I don't think anyone expects you to win. Now they they probably have belief themselves. Mm -hmm. And for you know Webb and Yam and, and to a lesser extent some of those other players on like a Rudy Gobert, they have a chance to write an amazing story for themselves and their nation. So I think they should be really excited to go out there. And you know Victor, it could be you know you have those we call those coming out moments. You know it could be for him. Wemby, this could be for him if he plays yep. really well, win or lose. So um, against a bunch, just a team of loaded American basketball yes, stars. So, so good. Yeah, I, I I think like it's it's a good. It would be something worth watching. I think it'd be fun to I see. I agree with you. It is um, a great. It does set up for a great final. It really that, does. A great gold medal match. And you know, Wemby, it, it's probably not going to be the equivalent of a of a golden goal. You know, unless he hits you know, right. a shot. You know, a buzzer beater shot to win it. But it's not far off that. You know, in terms of like him having a chance to beat a a powerhouse in the Americans at home in Paris, really set the stage for what he's going to become as a player. And France is a has been a defensive juggernaut throughout the tournament. Like, they really shut down Canada. They did that to Germany today. And, you know, if anyone's likely to blow through that, it would be the Americans, but that'll be the challenge. You know, the, France has been hitting shots and defending well and getting leads and holding on. See what the Americans bring in the uh, gold medal match. All right, hour two coming up. Gord Miller from Paris is taking the games. What he saw at a beach volleyball today. Our Canadian women are off to the gold medal match. And noodles coming up as well on water, athleticism, confidence. <laughs> There's a lot to get into with him. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on the TSN app.